Warren Buffett says if you invested 10K in index funds in 1942, you'd now have $51 million, and that you can still replicate this today. And many people argue that index funds are the only way to make money in the stock market, that everything else is either luck or manipulation. But is that really true? Or is this some kind of lie to get the average investor to prop up the economy? Right now, the markets are bleeding. So I wanted to see if index funds are really as powerful as some economists say. Because if index funds mirror the market's performance, then choosing a basket means choosing an index or a sector within a bleeding economy. Does that make sense? So the real question is, which sectors can make you rich during a recession? We're gonna cover a real index fund strategy and my top five list. Because when you're investing, you got two problems. The first one is timing. It's about knowing when to buy and when to sell. And one strategy made to battle this problem is called contrarian investing. Rothschild, he allegedly say, buy when there's blood in the streets, which is a gruesome way of saying saying most investors' emotions just betray them. And right now, the markets are dangerous. Nobody knows what's gonna happen next, and that's scary. People are just giving up on investing right now. The S&P 500 is dropping in a pattern that looks similar to the dot-com bubble, and it's happening three times faster. So does the contrarian strategy actually work? Again, Buffett thinks it does. You've probably heard the quote, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. Buffett can back that up. Between 73 and 74, the stock market had one of the greatest crashes ever. There was a war in the Middle East, a recession, and double-digit inflation. I know it sounds pretty familiar. But it was literally an apocalypse where the market lost 45% in less than two years. And in all of this, good old Warren saw an opportunity and snatched a stake in the Washington Post. He kept that for a few years, before selling it for over 100 times the price. Now, there's no formula for success, but cases like this show a key point, which is the research, because this strategy is not about buying what's on sale. It's about digging and figuring out which companies or sectors have prices that just don't represent their actual value, also known as their intrinsic value. And that's the second problem when you're investing, choosing what to actually buy, because you can choose from thousands of companies from all over the world, and handpicking them is riskier than chasing down Vecna and the upside down. That's when index funds come into play. When some people hear index funds, they think of them like a lousy marriage. Long-term commitment, low returns, and a less than ideal amount of action. But the truth is, more action isn't always better. These are powerful. An index fund is essentially a basket. It's a portfolio that tracks the performance of a specific group of investments. They follow the market instead of trying to beat the market. As Jack Bogle said, don't look for the needle in the haystack, just buy the haystack. Now, let me give you my top five haystacks during the recession and then let's really analyze the pros and cons of investing in these funds. When looking at an index fund, there's a few elements to take a major gander at. The first one is what specific market or industry is that fund tracking? This gives you the scope of the investment. For example, it could be the S&P 500, emerging economies, growth companies, or obesity. Seriously. The second element is the fees. That's the percentage of your investment that goes into the manager's pockets, then eventually strippers' pockets, which could be a reason why strippers can predict a recession pretty well. But believe it or not, it's always better to choose funds that charge low expense ratios. We're talking 0.1 to maybe like 0.4%. The third element to look at is the minimum investment. Now, many funds have no restrictions, and you can start with literally pennies. That's when they sell fractional shares. Other funds have minimum investments of a few thousand dollars or more. And now, number five. My fifth index fund pick is about renewable energies. Right now, we're on track to abandon fossil fuels forever. Both Europe and the US are banning the sale of petrol vehicles by 2035. And this is a trend we'll see in other industries as well. But there's a problem. There are different competing technologies in the green sector. Wind power, solar, hydrogen, electric, and we really don't know who the winner will be. That's why I'd focus on a fund that covers a broad spectrum, such as the iShares Global Clean Energy ETF. It has an expense ratio of 0.42%, and it covers an index of global equities across many renewable sources. Another option, it's a good one, but has way too many words in its name, the First Trust NASDAQ Clean Edge Green Energy Fund. Fund. Now, number four, healthcare, not to be confused with the obesity ETF. This industry is changing for many reasons, and for every change comes a chance to make a buck. Average lifespans keep increasing, and that's not gonna stop. The pandemic made healthcare even more front of mind, and the space dominated
dominated the IPO scene last year, raising $17 billion in equity. It's not only pharmaceuticals and equipment, but biotechnology, medical supplies, and insurance. With the world population reaching 8 billion, health is kind of like betting both on black and red at the same time. To invest in this, an option is the Healthcare Select Sector SPDR Fund. It includes companies from the S&P 500 like Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, and United Health, and it has a nice and low expense ratio of 0.1%. Number three, semiconductors. You know those little things that everyone talks about and no one really knows what they are? Well, we're in the middle of a tech revolution. Essentially, every company is becoming a tech company. And the link between electric vehicles, 5G technology, AI, rockets, robot girlfriends, and new computers is semiconductors. Chip makers supply the most advanced companies in the world, and the recent shortage has shown governments that we just need more and more of these chips. So a potential fund is the Vanex Semiconductor ETF. Chips are made by just a few companies worldwide, and this fund tracks 25 of them. The expense ratio is 0.35%, but overall, this is a slightly riskier investment. That's because of the chip shortage and the political tension between China and the US. However, McKinsey sees the sector as a trillion dollar one by 20 30. On to the top two, large caps. When you invest here, you're fishing for the biggest whales, like literally Moby Dick. You've got Amazon, Coca-Cola, and Microsoft. That's why it's generally a solid long-term choice. However, there's a catch. Recently, large cap tech got hit harder than Amber Heard in court. So I have two options for you here. One is the Vanguard Value ETF. It's focused on stocks that trade below intrinsic value, and it's pretty diversified across tech, healthcare, and energy. And the other one is the explosive Vanguard Growth ETF. It's riskier with 50% tech stocks and just loves companies with a top-notch track record. A third bonus option here is the Fidelity Zero Large Cap. It's big, diversified, and has zero fees. And now my number one. It's a classic, the S&P 500. It's basically the American economy, and that's why it's pretty hard to beat. You could go for the Vanguard S&P or the Schwab one. Both of them are solid and have low fees. By the way, you'll notice that I didn't include any real estate funds. That's because the housing market is uncertain right now, and prices are at all-time highs. And I covered that in a separate video that will be linked in the description. Now the main question. Are index funds really more profitable, or is this some kind of trick that we need to be aware of? Again, Jack Bogle, the legendary founder of the Vanguard Group, he argues that everybody dreams of picking the right stock, like an Apple or a Google in the beginning, make outstanding returns, get rich and move to Cabo, or maybe here in Puerto Rico. And he's right, but he claims that you shouldn't rely on individual stocks, but what you can do is follow an index, own the whole stock market. They're cheaper than active funds, and they often perform better anyways. Again, Warren Buffett says if you invested 10K in the S&P 500 in 1942, you would now have $51 million. In other words, we're going back to the beginning. Index funds solve the two main trading problems, the what and the when. So are Bogle and Buffett right? Yes and also no. There are some cons to keep in mind. One is that it's easier to examine the specifics of a single company. I get what Bogle means when he says don't look for the needle, but if you have a decent knowledge of business, you can read about the company, the CEO, the balance sheets, and you have time to do all this, you can come up with a solid valuation on a company. But you can't really do that with index funds. They're based on a general hypothesis about macroeconomic trends, politics, and industry advancements. But there's something deeper here as well. There's a correlation between the GDP of a country and its stock market. With broad index funds, what you're really doing is betting on a country's economy. So it's true what Buffett says, that if you invested in 1942, you'd be mega rich by now. But what happened between 1942 and today is a unique moment in history. It's the era where the US became a global superpower. Kind of like investing in Italy right before the Renaissance, or in France right before Napoleon, if Napoleon lasted a little bit longer. So the historical circumstances were extremely special. Charlie Munger hammered this point home when he said that if you invested in the Japanese economy in the past 30 years, you would have lost money. The Nikkei index just got back to where it was before the crash in 1990. So maybe the US economy will skyrocket in the next decades, but that's still a broad assumption. And that's why it's always better to diversify, even into new emerging economies. All things considered, my bottom line is that index funds are a great idea. Not financial advice, of course. Maybe they're not your only investment, but 
they can be the backbone of your portfolio, a sort of safety net slowly growing in the background. And if you're looking for even more investing strategies under a microscope, you need to check out our exclusive membership platform, Finova. There you'll get access to everything I'm personally investing in, participate in live coaching calls every single day, get free courses, and be part of a community of people working to get a little bit better every single day. That'll be linked in the description below. I'd like to thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a profitable day.